Welcome back to our learning course. In this lesson, we will start talking about Pavlovian conditioning, also known as classical conditioning. We will first look at the basic Pavlovian conditioning experiment, then look at a few examples, and finally summarize what we have learned. What we now call Pavlovian conditioning was first studied by Russian physiologist Ivan Pavlov at the end of the 19th century. His experiments are some of the most famous in all of psychology, and they are now part of all introductory psychology courses and textbooks. Even if the experiments are often simple, the results are intriguing and not always easy to understand. Psychologists still debate about what exactly Pavlovian conditioning tells us about learning. An important reason why Pavlovian conditioning continues to draw so much interest is that it has many applications to human health, animal welfare, and animal training. We will see many of these applications in later lessons. Let's see now what Pavlov discovered that is so interesting. The basic experiment was very simple, and you've probably heard about it before. At the time, Pavlov was studying what causes saliva to flow. He measured how much dogs would salivate in response to different stimuli placed in the mouth, like food or sour liquid. However, he ran into trouble when the dogs started salivating even before the stimulus touched their mouth. Pavlov realized that the dogs were learning about the experimental situation. Somehow, they could anticipate that something was about to happen even before perceiving the stimulus in their mouth. To understand better what was happening, Pavlov arranged his famous experiment. Before stimulating the dog's mouth to produce saliva, Pavlov introduced a meaningless stimulus that he could easily turn on and off. For example, he turned on a sound, here indicated by a bell icon, and then gave the dog food, here indicated by a pizza slice. This was repeated many times, sound, food, sound, food, sound, food, and so on. After a number of repetitions, Pavlov could confirm that the dog started to salivate already when it heard the sound, before the food appeared. In summary, the sound food experiences have changed the dog behavior in response to the sound. In other words, the dog had learned something. This graph shows a replication of Pavlov's experiment performed by Allison in 1964. As we can see, there is initially no salivation to the sound, but as experiences accumulate, salivation increases until it reaches an approximately stable level. Now, let's revisit what Pavlov did in more general terms. Every Pavlovian conditioning experiment can be described using four elements. Two are stimuli, and two are responses. They are called unconditioned or conditioned. Let's see what this means. The unconditioned stimulus, or US, is the stimulus that is already meaningful to the animal before the experiment starts. By meaningful, we mean that the animal displays specific behaviors in response to the stimulus. As recalled above, the unconditioned stimuli used by Pavlov caused salivation, but many other options are possible. For example, we can use a mild electric shock or a loud noise to startle the animal. We will encounter many kinds of unconditioned stimuli in this and future lessons. The animal's response to the US is called the unconditioned response, or UR. In Pavlov's case, this was salivation. The stimulus that is presented before the US is called the conditioned stimulus, or CS. This is a stimulus that, at the beginning of the experiment, is no special significance to the animal. In Pavlov's original experiments, this was a sound or a light. Finally, the response that the animal learns is called the conditioned response, or CR. This was salivation in Pavlov's experiment, but we will see many other examples. So, a Pavlovian conditioning experiment can be summarized by saying that the CS is presented before a US, and as a consequence, a CR is learned. This is the same image from before, with the new terms added. The bowl of food was the US, drooling in response to food was the UR, the sound was the CS, and drooling in response to the sound was the CR. Before we look at more examples of Pavlovian conditioning, let me clarify why Pavlovian conditioning research often focuses on weird behaviors like dog drool or rabbit eye blink. These behaviors have been chosen partly by accident, because someone found a way to measure them reliably and to train them relatively easily. 
For example, Pavlov could notice that salivation can be changed by learning because he was already measuring salivation as part of his studies on digestion. The fact that Pavlov measures salivation, however, does not mean that the change in salivation is the only or the most interesting aspect of learning. We can appreciate this point in this video, showing a puppy waiting for food. We cannot see if the puppy is salivating or not, but we can see that it does many other things that show us that it understands that food is about to come. It wags its tail, goes to check the food bowl, and so on. In summary, the salivation CR or any other CR is just an index that learning has happened. It is not the main interest of the psychologist. Our main interest as a psychologist is to understand how learning works, not what makes dogs salivate or rabbits blink. If you keep in mind our goal of understanding learning, all this talk of salivation and blinking will make more sense. Another way of appreciating why Pavlovian conditioning is interesting is to see it in action in humans. We will see plenty of applications to human health in future lessons. In this lesson, we start with a few simple examples. In this first example, we see a baby taking a bath. A parent squirts the baby with water using a toy football. Here it comes. The baby wiggles in response. After a couple of times, we will see that the baby starts wiggling already at the sight of the football. This is another squirt by the parent. And now the parent is not squirting, but the baby is wiggling all the same. What are the elements of Pavlovian conditioning here? The US is the water squirt, and the UR is wiggling. The CS is the site of the toy football, and the CR is again wiggling. Our next example is a classroom demonstration of Pavlovian conditioning from the 1980s. The students were provided with some instant lemonade powder and were instructed to taste a bit of it any time the professor spoke the word Pavlov. This procedure is summarized in the first line of this table. Once in a while, the professor said Pavlov, but asked the student not to taste the lemonade powder. Rather, the students had to raise their hand if their mouth watered when hearing the word Pavlov. The first part of this graph shows the percentage of students who raised their hands over the course of the experiment. As we can see, hearing Pavlov did not initially produce salivation, but it increasingly had this effect. Note that salivation is not voluntarily, the students were not trying consciously to salivate when hearing Pavlov. It is a more primitive, unconscious part of the brain that does this learning. This is typical of Pavlovian learning, and we will see in later lessons that it sometimes works against our better judgment. By now, it should be easy to identify the four elements of this experiment as follows. The US is the sweet and sour taste of the lemonade powder. The UR is salivation, the CS is the word Pavlov, and the CR is salivation again. The experiment went beyond what we've seen so far in that it included two additional experimental phases. The first was an extinction phase. Extinction is the term psychologists use when they attempt to get rid of a behavior by withdrawing the US. So in this case, the extinction phase consisted of repeating the word Pavlov many times without being followed by the lemonade power taste. We can see that during the course of extinction, the percentage of students reporting salivation decreases until it reaches essentially zero. At this point, in a third phase of the experiment, the professor asked again the students to taste the lemonade powder after hearing Pavlov. And we see that this leads to a rapid return of salivation. This reacquisition of the salivation response is faster than the first acquisition. And this is typical. And it tells us that extinction did not completely erase what had been learned previously. We will expand on this topic in a future lesson. Let's see a last example where we have a video evidence of Pavlovian conditioning in a human. We will see how a student named David conditions a reaction in his roommate, Brian. I don't endorse doing the same with your roommates, although I admit to having done something similar in ninth grade. Let's watch the video and then we will discuss it. Hey Psych 101 class, I'm David and I'm going to be testing Pavlov's theory of classical conditioning on my roommate, Brian. 
The condition stimulus will be the sound effect. That was easy. And then I'm going to shoot him with this airsoft gun. He will soon learn the relationship between the sound effect and the shot before it gets too hurt. That was easy. That was easy. Ah! That was easy. Fuck. That was easy. <laughs> Alright guys, looks like Pavlov's theory worked. Alright, by now the four elements of this Pavlovian conditioning demonstration should be clear. The US is the mild pain from the airsoft gun. The UR is a startle or flinching reaction. The CS is the that was easy sound effect. And the CR again is a startle or flinching. In the examples that we've seen so far, the conditioned and unconditioned response always look the same. The dog and the student salivated, the baby wiggled, and the roommate flinched to both the US and the CS. Why do we insist in calling one response the UR and the other the CR? There are at least two reasons. One is to keep in mind that the CR is learned during the experiment, while the UR was there already. So even if they look the same, the UR and the CR have different histories, so to speak. Another important reason is that the CR and UR are not always similar. Let's see this in a video. In this video, we will see a rat experience a sound CS followed by an electric shock US. This first part of the video shows the rat's reaction to the shock. The shock is about to come here. Here it comes. As we can see, the rat jumps and gets agitated. Now let's see what the rat does when it hears the sound. Note that this is a rat that has already learned that the sound will be followed by the shock. The sound is playing, and what the rat does is that it freezes. The rat stops moving and kind of waits anxiously. In this case, we have learned that when the CS is a sound and the US is a shock, the CR in the rat is freezing, while the UR is startled. The two behaviors are not the same in this case. We will get back to this important fact in a future lesson, but for now, let's just remember that we have at least two reasons to distinguish the response to the CS from the response to the US. Let's summarize what we have learned so far about Pavlovian conditioning. Whenever we think about Pavlovian conditioning, it's useful to keep in mind Pavlov's original experiment. In Pavlovian conditioning, animals learn a new response called the conditioned response, or CR for short. In this case, salivation. The animal performs the CR when it perceives a stimulus, called the condition stimulus, or CS. In this case, a sound. This learning is a consequence of the CS being experienced before an unconditioned stimulus, or US, here food. What makes a stimulus unconditioned is simply the fact that it produces an unconditioned response, or UR. Here, the UR is salivation. To this, I would like to add two things. The first is that the CR depends on the CS, the US and the animal. If we use sound and food, dogs will typically salivate, wag their tails, tight approach to the food location, and so on. If we use different stimuli or a different animal, things will be different, as we have seen before in our examples. However, we cannot decide what the CR will be. We cannot decide, for example, to have the dog sit or roll when it would salivate normally. These behaviors, sitting and rolling, can be trained, but not with Pavlovian conditioning. In Pavlovian conditioning, it is the animal that decides, so to speak, what the appropriate CR is to a given CS and US. We will revisit this point in future lessons. The second thing I'd like to add is that we should always keep in mind that the CS is followed by the US regardless of what the animal does. For example, Pavlov always offered meat to his dogs, regardless of whether the dog had salivated to the CS or not. Salivation appeared spontaneously, without being required, and this is true of any Pavlovian conditioned response. It requires some effort to understand the meaning of this fact, which we will revisit in a future lesson.
this lesson is over. The best lessons to study next are the other lessons on Pavlovian conditioning and then the lesson that introduces instrumental conditioning. Happy learning to everyone!